Thank you for joining us for session one of our training, Using UN Biodiversity Lab to Monitor the Pulse of the Planet. My name is Amber McCollum, and myself and Juan Torres Perez will be your RSET trainers today, along with many other guest speakers we have here from the United Nations Development Program and others who are using the UN Biodiversity Lab in their work. We are honored to have all of our partners here today and throughout the training series over the next few weeks. For this training, we will have two types of sessions. Our intermediate sessions, which will all be held here on GoToWebinar, where you will use the same registration link to join. These sessions will consist of lectures and case study examples. The 1.5 hour immediate, intermediate sessions will be held today, April 14th, and on April 21st and 28th. Note that for the intermediate sessions, we will present the same material each day in English, Spanish, and French in separate sessions. So please sign up for your language of choice. We will also have two labs that will be hosted by our UNDP colleagues via Zoom. These will be presented in English with simultaneous interpretation in French and Spanish. The registration for these was capped at 150 participants, and they are already full. We have a lot of interest for these advanced labs. However, you can sign up for future notifications about the UN Biodiversity Lab advanced trainings on the course website. All the course materials can be found on the RSET training website shown here. This will include the recordings of all the sessions via links to our YouTube channel, the presentation materials, and eventually a link to a Google Form homework for the intermediate sessions. I also want to encourage you all to type your questions into the chat box along the way. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible at the end. We will also post the answers to the questions on our website after the training. So you can use that as a really nice resource um, in the future. If we don't get to your question or we don't post it up on the website later on, you can email myself or my colleagues at our email addresses listed here. For all three of the intermediate sessions, we will have one follow-on homework that will be available on the course website. To receive credit for this homework, you must submit your answers via Google Forms by the deadline of Thursday, May 12th. The link to the homework will be available uh, on the RSET website during the final intermediate session. So do please check back on the website on April 28th for that homework link. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live intermediate webinars and complete the homework by the deadline. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive your certificate for the intermediate session about two months after the completion. The UNDP group will also be issuing certificates of completion for each of their advanced labs. Each of these labs will require a homework assignment to be submitted and more details on the submission process and those certificates will be provided during those sessions. So check back then um, for more information there. Here's a general overview of our three intermediate sessions. Today we will focus on an introduction to spatial data and policies for biodiversity. And this will really set the stage um, with NASA data as well as a little bit of the global policy context. Next week, we will focus more specifically on exploring the UN Biodiversity Lab public platform and the data sets they have available on their web tool. In the final week, we will explore the UN Biodiversity Lab secure workspaces and all of their functionalities. For the advanced labs, each with their own registration and approval process, the UNBL team will walk through a deep dive of the public platform in session one, and then a deep dive of the workspaces in session two. These labs will have hands-on exercises to guide you through using these functionalities. 
So this week, we will begin with an overview of NASA Earth observations for biodiversity and ecosystem monitoring. I will then hand it over to our guest speakers, where they will discuss global policies for biodiversity and how the UNDP supports these initiatives. They will also provide a brief overview of the UN Biodiversity Lab platform and mapping essential life support areas. Then we will hear from a few in-country case studies. At the end of this session, we will have time for question and answer, as I mentioned previously. So with you all joining us today, we'd like to get an idea of where everyone is coming from. So we've posted this uh, Mentimeter QR code here um, where you can go on to the Mentimeter poll and complete this and tell us where you're from. We will also post the link in the chat so you can access the poll there. So please do take a moment to um, answer this poll. All right, thank you so much for everyone who completed the poll. It's really so exciting to see all of these participants from around the globe coming together um, to share their interest in monitoring the planet and um, thinking of biodiversity and conservation and ecosystem functions. Um, it's really great to have you all here. So, so thanks so much. Okay, so now let's start off with an overview of remote sensing for biodiversity and ecosystems. Remote sensing, or taking images or other measurements of Earth from above, provides a unique perspective on what is happening on the Earth and thus plays a special role in biodiversity and conservation applications. Consistent measurements in space and time provide the information necessary to study changes and trends in ecosystems. Remote sensing data are often paired with ground observations for a more holistic picture of ecosystems and species dynamics. And these data are also particularly useful in remote regions where ground observations may be scarce. These images you can see at the bottom provide two examples, elephant tracks in Botswana and sandpiper probability map in California. There are many ecosystem variables that can be measured via remote sensing, and we will discuss some of these products um, on the UN Biodiversity Lab. Oftentimes, remote sensing data is used to understand the physical environment and how that environment changes. This can be used to provide indirect estimates of available habitat for a particular species. Much of these data are used as input for species distribution models and in many cases is being used for things like genetic analysis. We covered some of this um, in a training um, that we provided a couple of years ago on freshwater habitats and looking at something called eDNA for monitoring um, species movement. And um, it's a really exciting example. Land cover maps are also very often used and multiple maps generated over time can identify changes like fragmentation and degradation. Remote sensing is also useful for monitoring things like vegetation health with indices like the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index or NDVI that serve as a proxy for suitable habitat. The image here is a map of forest canopy height in the Amazon, which was generated with radar data. While we won't cover radar data here in this training, um, we do have a lot of RSET trainings on radar data. And we also did a um, SAR data for forest monitoring training um, a while back. So you can check on the RSET website and just search for SAR in the trainings and find a lot of these um, trainings available for, um, for viewing. So remote sensing, um, as I mentioned, is frequently used to, to create maps of terrestrial ecosystems and are often um, based on a map that delineates different types of vegetation. Um, these types of maps can identify discrete categories of land cover. They can be used, um, they can be generated using a variety of classification schemes. 
And they are really improved by local uh, ground data and knowledge. Um, so there are these sort of global maps available, um, but I also encourage you all to think about creating your own land cover maps for your region of interest, because you might have that local expert knowledge of your area um, that would generate different land cover features as opposed to something global. Um, and we do have some RSET trainings on doing land cover um, mapping as well. Um, however, these global maps are still very useful for identifying broad strokes of different uh, vegetation and land cover types globally. And as I also mentioned, remote sensing can be used to understand ecosystem functions, which um, in this case is essentially the measurement of energy dynamics within an ecosystem. So these types of variables can include things like net primary productivity. Um, they can be used to generate maps of evapotranspiration, albedo, and temperature. Um, and these really play into how an ecosystem is functioning and maybe how the ecosystems might be changing over time as well. And again, as mentioned previously, ecosystem change is really important for conservation and biodiversity research and applications. The evaluation of changes in, from forest to non-forest is one of the most common types of changes that we observe um, on the ground and that we map using remote sensing data. And here you can see an animation um, from Brazil where we see changes to the landscape from deforestation and then a fire um, and then new pasture lands being um, developed. While there are many benefits to the use of remote sensing data for biodiversity, it's really important to understand the limitations. Remote sensing data cannot do it all. Um, and they can really vary depending on the sensor being used. Also, the region you're studying and the questions you're asking. The primary challenge I see is the trade-off between temporal and spatial resolution. Oftentimes, the sensors that monitor a region more frequently have coarser resolution, and the higher spatial resolution sensors um, have a longer revisit time, so they're not viewing the same place on Earth as frequently. So there's, there's almost always a trade-off there. There can also be large amounts of data with unfamiliar file types, and so um, those of you who have used remote sensing data in the past have probably run across a file type or two that you don't really understand and, and cannot be easily um, imported into some kind of geospatial software. Um, however, I believe the barrier to this is being lowered through the proliferation of online tools, um, things like Google Earth Engine, where you don't necessarily have to download data, but you can run um, analysis and processing within the cloud. And um, finally, there are many more commercial satellite products available that often provide um, high spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution. So you don't necessarily have as much trade-off um, as I mentioned earlier. However, um, some of those data um, have come at a cost. So with all of the NASA data, it's all freely available for you to use. And commercial data, in, in most cases, um, we need to be bought um, for your particular region. So again, there are limitations, there are trade-offs. It's really, really important to keep this in mind as you use remote sensing data. Okay, so with that in mind, let's discuss a few of the really commonly used satellites and sensors for um, creating some of these biodiversity and ecosystem data layers that you'll be investigating with the UN Biodiversity Lab. So you, many of you, and maybe all of you are familiar with Landsat. It's the, um, one of the most popular satellites out there. And it was first launched in um, the early 70s. And most recently, Landsat 9 was just launched in September of last year. And it's really exciting to see all of these Landsats 
come together because we have this continuous data at fairly high resolution, which is really useful for examining those changes over time that I mentioned. And all of these data are freely available um, via the USGS. And Landsat is a passive sensor that provides optical imagery of the same place on the globe around every 16 days. But now we currently have multiple Landsats in orbit, so you can really obtain an image um, almost every eight days. Um, and Landsat 9 um, took the place of Landsat 7 in orbit, so you get those more frequent revisit times. Um, there are also some differences in um, the bands available for these different um, Landsat satellites, so that's something to keep in mind as you're using potentially data from different Landsat um, sensors over time. So Landsat is really one of the most prolific satellites for monitoring our Earth ecosystems. This visualization shows one location in Western Tanzania where the Jane Goodall Institute worked. And after focusing on this region in um, the Gombe National Park, this visualization shows changes in forest cover between 1972 and 1999. Forested areas are shown in green and non-forested regions are shown in brown. So it gives you another example of the use of these data. As mentioned previously, there are pros and cons that need to be considered when using Landsat data. Um, we have this nice long period of record, um, and the resolution is um, higher than many NASA satellites, but still not really, really high spatial resolution. Um, but the revisit time is every 16 or every eight days if you're using different sat Landsat satellites. Um, so that, those are things to consider. Um, here's another example of how Landsat was used for conservation and biodiversity, where the animation here on the right shows how disturbances have affected the forest of the spotted owl over time. MODIS is another key sensor. It, it was designed to measure large-scale global dynamics across lands, oceans, and atmospheres. It flies on two satellites, so it allows MODIS to capture um, imagery of the same place on Earth every day. The spatial resolution of MODIS, though, is, is uh, quite coarse, um, but varies from 250 meters to one kilometer. And there are 36 bands, including the visible and the near infrared, which are really great for monitoring things like vegetation. Like Landsat, the details of the sensor and the subsequent imagery should be considered. MODIS, the greatest benefit of MODIS is the daily imagery. And while MODIS data are only available back to 2000, similar measurements will continue with a new sensor called VIRS, which I'll mention briefly as well. Um, the greatest downside to MODIS is the coarse spatial resolution. So this can make it difficult for mapping um, really fine scale landscape dynamics. So the Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or VIRS, as I mentioned, is sort of a follow on to MODIS. And it has a few extra updates um, a, uh, of the sensor. So these data are available from 2012 to present with a slightly improved spatial resolution for one of the channels at 375 meters. And there are also 750 meter products available. VIRS data can be used for similar mapping of vegetation changes and thermal anomalies. So it's really great for mapping fires, currently burning fires. Um, VIRS has also been used for mapping nighttime lights, which has been used for population mapping. And I know that that is um, a layer that's available in the UN Biodiversity Lab as well. So VIRS was created to act as this transition from MODIS. Um, and MODIS has been in orbit for over 20 years, which is uh, really incredible when we think about um, NASA satellites. Um, so the, the comparisons here, as I mentioned, the spatial resolution has improved a bit with VIRS. Um, this is illustrated in the image on the top right. The spectral, the spectral coverage is very similar. Um, but you don't get data in the mid-infrared band with VIRS. But that's generally not an issue for vegetation mapping. 
Um, VIRS also flies at a slightly higher orbit. So you, you get global coverage, but again, they're both optical imagery. So you do have to deal with clouds, which can be a, a real issue depending on the region that you are interested in. A recent example of VIRS data comes from the fires burning in Australia. Um, the animation on the left shows smoke plumes coming off of Eastern Australia and traveling across the globe in yellow. Um, the image then on the right indicates the um, actively burning fires that occurred um, in, in this year, uh, especially in, in 2020. The Advanced Very High Resolution Radiometer, or ADHRR, can also be used for ecosystem monitoring. It's operated by NOAA, and there are multiple instruments on board the POSE satellite. The Very High Resolution is a bit of a misnomer, because the spatial resolution is pretty coarse at about a little over a kilometer. Um, but the very high resolution refers to the temporal resolution because of the revisit time. So this is similar to um, FEARS and MODIS, um, where you can use AVHRR for quickly changing events, um, like wildfires, flooding, um, flowering. Um, and it has six spectral bands. And it includes the near infrared, mid infrared, and thermal bands. Um, and there are some global products, like the global land cover product that's produced by NOAA, that's really useful um, from AVHRR. The European Space Agency also has a suite of satellites that can be used for biodiversity. Most um, commonly used is Sentinel 2, which is very similar to Landsat with with some pretty um, cool improvements. It has an improved spatial resolution of 10 to 20 meters, and it has a shorter revisit time of about five days. And there's been a lot of work that's gone into creating a harmonized Landsat and Sentinel product, and you can get more information about that via the link here. Um, also, there are many spot satellites created by the French Space Agency. And um, those can be used for um, monitoring the visible and near infrared bands and have a higher spatial, spatial resolution of about six meters with a pretty short revisit time as well. So um, those are of interest as well. There are also elevation data sets that can be particularly useful to identify landscape characteristic, characteristics. Um, since 2014, the um, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, or JAXA, has provided um, the, this 3D product um, covering the global land area. And um, this, this sensor uh, provides the uh, surface elevation at about five meters. So it's, it's a really useful um, product to use. And then also the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission, or SRTM, which which flew in 2000 provides elevation data as well. And, and it can oftentimes be combined with optical data to produce something like the map you see here, where you have um, uh, the optical information of vegetation alongside the elevation information from SRTM. And finally, I wanted to briefly mention the enormous benefit of using synthetic aperture radar data or SAR data. I mentioned this earlier. But they are particularly useful for monitoring things like um, structure. So the main difference here between optical and radar data um, is that the optical data are sensitive to spectral properties. And the radar data is sensitive to things like moisture content or um, roughness on the ground uh, on the land surface. So the radar data is especially sensitive to the bulk of the vegetation or biomass and things like moisture content in, in the vegetation in the soil. The one particular benefit of the use of SAR data is the ability to penetrate clouds and to characterize the canopy and the understory of forests. The limitation of SAR data is that they, um, they, the data are not available globally. Um, but we do have some upcoming NASA missions that are really exciting in this realm, um, in particular for forest applications. So I've listed a few. Uh, you can see a few of the 
the SAR um, data sets here. And, and as I also mentioned, we have a lot of RSA trainings on, on these type of data as well. I also wanted to briefly point out that there are many layers on UNBL, and we'll see these in session in session two of our immediate, intermediate session, but I wanted to highlight the fact that many of these layers are created using the um, NASA satellites and sensors that I mentioned. So we have a few examples here. I talked about MODIS. Um, it's really commonly used for things like um, monitoring um, burned areas. Um, we have NDVI layers from MODIS. Um, we have things like gross primary production. And then I also mentioned the nighttime lights, looking at population activities. And Landsat is really uh, oftentimes used for things like global forest change. Um, and that, that layer is also available via Global Forest Watch as well. And here are a few other examples of satellite-derived layers, such as the Forest Structural Integrity Index, which overlays an index of human pressure, the human footprint, on the forest structural condition. And this is used to identify structurally complex forests with low human pressure that are likely to be the most valuable for biodiversity and ecosystem services. There's also a carbon density layer that's really important to identify carbon sinks and was created using both AVHRR and MODIS. Um, and there are a few global land cover data um, layers available, which I, I mentioned is really useful for biodiversity monitoring. And one of them is from um, the Sentinel-2 satellite and it's available at um, a resolution of 10 meters. And also I've mentioned the, the global digital surface model here too. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means. It's just a few examples and um, clearly highlights the connection between the satellite data and the layers that you'll find on UNBL. Um, I wanted to note that the team will give much more information about these layers in, in our second intermediate session as well. So stay tuned for that. So now I'd like to hand it over to Laura Weathernan who will be discussing the global policy framework for biodiversity and sustainable development. Um, so thank you so much and over to you, Lauren. Excellent, thank you very much, Amber, and it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Lauren Weatherden. I'm a senior program officer at the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center here in Cambridge. And I am very happy to sort of set the stage with the global policy frameworks. We've heard about the amazing range of environmental monitoring that NASA can support through their satellites and sensors, but let's take a step back and ask, why is this work important? Let's paint a picture starting with the bad news. The news that shows us the urgency of taking action to safeguard nature and to address the climate crisis. No matter where we look, we are witnessing an unraveling of the planet. The most recent landmark report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shows that we must act within this decade to mitigate the catastrophic impacts of climate change. And in 2019, the equivalent report on biodiversity from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services reported that we are seeing an unprecedented decline of nature with over 1 million species at risk of extinction. These twin threats to the survival of life on Earth are increasingly recognized as deeply interconnected. As just one example, unsustainable land use now accounts for over one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. So as we look at these intertwined essential challenges of our times, what do we do and what can we do? At the global level, we have in place powerful international policy frameworks that can support countries to take action across the key issues of our time. These international agreements, many which have near universal ratification, set the standard for the development of national policies and action plans and provide a key way to build political will. The United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted in 2015 by UN member states, sets out 17 sustainable development goals to ensure human well-being and planetary health with no one left behind. The 2030 Agenda approaches social, economic and environmental sustainability sorry, as indivisible. The Convention on Biological Diversity, with its 196 parties, 
sets global priorities for the conservation and sustainable use of nature. And the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, with 197 parties, as well as its landmark 2015 Paris Agreement, sets global targets for mitigating and adapting to climate change. And finally, the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, the third and final of the so-called Rio Conventions, is the sole legally binding international agreement linking environment and development to sustainable land management. This list is not intended to be exhaustive, but rather to draw your attention to some of the key global political mandates that help to influence our work in response to biodiversity and climate crises. While these global policy frameworks are relevant to the nature agenda, we would like to stress that the challenges they address are highly interlinked, both to each other as well as to our social and economic systems. That means that all actors in society and across all sectors need to work together on the nature agenda. Some of the areas of collaboration are outlined on this slide, including the conservation and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems that is necessary to protect and enhance nature's contributions to people. These international agreements are translated into national action through key national targets and policy documents. For sustainable development, each country's national development plan and other key policies will chart action towards their achievement of the SDGs. Under the Convention on Biological Diversity, National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, or M MBSAPs, include national targets and action plans to achieve them. In the climate space, Countries have developed nationally determined contributions as their pledges to support the Paris Agreement. While Red Plus is also a mechanism to support reducing emissions associated with forests that contribute directly to these NDCs. Under the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, parties have also set their own land degradation neutrality targets. And taken together, these commitments and plans can provide a very strong framework from which to take action. However, there is a complex and challenging body of work behind this. Often we see that action under each of these agreements is siloed across different ministries or even different branches of the same ministry. And we see this trend, same trend in action taken by intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, and civil society. So how can we bring this different work together? Let's start with one very specific example. One powerful way to take action for nature, climate, and for people is to invest in actions for tropical forests. Tropical forest loss accounts for more than 90% of global deforestation and is equivalent to the total greenhouse gas emissions of the European Union. Investments in stopping deforestation in tropical countries comprise less than 1.5% or only 3.2 billion US dollars of the 256 billion US dollars committed by multilateral institutions and developed country donors since 2010 as directed towards climate change mitigation. Shifting this narrative to support action for tropical forests is one of a large number of actions that fall under the category of nature-based solutions. So what are nature-based solutions? In short, Nature-based solutions are the protection, restoration, and sustainable use of forests, grasslands, and wetlands. Nature-based solutions not only address the biodiversity crisis, but can also help to contribute both to climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as combat desertification and land deg degradation, and enhance food and water security. They have been emphasized as critical by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they are often already included in national biodiversity and Red Plus plans. Not only are nature-based solutions a key way to link those international and national commitments that I mentioned, but they are also often already promoted at the local level by indigenous peoples and local communities. So returning to another example, if we want to succeed in holding global warming beneath two degrees Celsius, the current emissions reductions outlined in nationally de determined contributions would need to be tripled. If we would like to hold it below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we would need to increase those commitments by fivefold. 
Nature-based solutions can provide us with up to one third of climate change mitigation solutions. So the really the key theme here is that nature-based action is powerful and investment in action to protect, store and sustainably manage nature can deliver for biodiversity, climate and sustainable development outcomes. Under the leadership of the Secretary General, the UN system has committed to integrate biodiversity and nature-based solutions into our work and how we support member states. UN entities have collectively committed to help implement the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, which in turn will help us to achieve the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The heads of the UN system entities are part of the Chief Executives Board for Coordination, or the CEB, and all have recognized this urgency to act. Under this common approach to biodiversity, UN system entities will collaborate at the global, regional and national levels with a view to fulfill human rights, to create peaceful societies and planetary stability, to accelerate a green and inclusive economic recovery, and to support institutional capacity, accountability and justice. One important dimension is to make good use of information and communication technologies, which are crucial for helping us to know where and how to act. This is very much where spatial data comes in, the data provided by that diverse array of satellites and sensors that Amber introduced earlier. Spatial data can support us to identify the where and the how to take effective action that delivers across the key issues of our time. These data can likewise play a powerful role in monitoring progress towards the ambitious international targets set out by the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and the Nature-Based Sustainable Development Goals. Through UNDP and UNEP's work to support 140 countries to fulfill their commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity, we have come to recognize that policymakers' capacity to access and use these valuable planetary data is highly variable. An analysis we conducted showed that a shockingly no low number of countries used spatial data in their national biodiversity plans and reports. Imagine that I'm your average government policymaker looking at my country's national biodiversity plan to try to figure out where to take action for nature. On average, I will find about four maps and one of these will be my country's political boundaries. If I turn to the official national report on the state of biodiversity, this number is on average around five maps. One out of every three countries will have no actionable maps that can tell them where to implement new protection or restoration initiatives. And less than 4% of the maps that are included in these reports focus on the ecosystem services, that critical connection between our work on nature, climate and sustainable development. So what we saw with this analysis was a really important gap between the potential for spatial data to be used as a key tool to guide effective action and that of the ability to, of governments to be able to actually use these data. And with this in mind, we created UN Biodiversity Lab to help address this need. And to introduce UN Biodiversity Lab, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Annie Vernick from UNDP. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our participants. My name is Annie Vernick, and I'm a Strategic Advisor on Spatial Planning at UNDP. And it's my pleasure to give you an introduction to our UN Biodiversity Lab platform today. So let me start very basic. What is UN Biodiversity Lab? UNBL is a free open source platform that provides policymakers with access to the best spatial data and analytic tools, regardless of their GIS experience. We created UNBL nearly four years ago, specifically to support parties in their commitments to the Convention on Biological Diversity, with a focus on the sixth national report to the convention. With the initial launch of the platform, based on the statistics that Lauren sh shared in her previous presentation, we challenged countries 
to double the number of maps between their fifth national report and their sixth national report. And they succeeded. Following the completion of the sixth national report, we fully re-envisioned UN Biodiversity Lab based on feedback from users to provide a wide range of functionalities to support planning, implementation, and monitoring of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. In October of last year, we launched this updated version of UN Biodiversity Lab, which we're excited to share with you today. So to get us started, I'd like to play a brief trailer to introduce you to the platform. From the streets of New York City to the heart of the Amazon, maps help us understand how our changing planet is affecting our lives. Maps help us see where nature is thriving and where it is being destroyed. Spatial data help decision makers put nature at the heart of sustainable development by helping them identify essential ecosystems that help us secure water, feed more than 7 billion people, avoid natural disasters, keep carbon in the ground, and sustain more than 2 billion livelihoods. We at the United Nations, together with our partners, are excited to launch the next iteration of the UN Biodiversity Lab. We have updated the UN Biodiversity Lab with new data and new functions to help decision makers put nature at the heart of development. To access more than 400 cutting edge global data sets, including the world's first 10 meter resolution land cover and land use map. To explore popular data collections that unlock the power of data on key thematic issues and that provide insights on how and where action is needed most. To create a secure workspace where you can upload your own data to generate your own insights on the intersection of nature, climate, and sustainable development. To calculate dynamic indicators such as deforestation, showing the state of the planet at the click of a button. To generate your own powerful maps that can guide local and national action for nature, climate, and sustainable development. Powered by Microsoft's planetary computer and supported by more than 30 data providers, the UN Biodiversity Lab provides novel insight that is essential for putting nature at the heart of sustainable development. Our goal is to enable everyone to harness the power of data, to equip policymakers with powerful tools to make more informed decisions on nature, and to be able to monitor the pulse of our planet. Join us. Start exploring today at unbiodiversitylab.org. Great. So our trailer provided you with just a glimpse of the functionalities available through UN Biodiversity Lab. I'd like to take the rest of my time today to highlight what exactly has changed and provide a little bit of detail about these new functionalities. So overall, what's new? At the center of our redesign was making UNBL more user-friendly and intuitive so that anyone, anywhere, can easily utilize the platform. To do this, we improved design and made the platform fully available in five languages. We also recognize that being able to share data across platforms, such as many of the other platforms that are operating in this space, will be essential. To do this, we built UNBL to be able to share and receive data from other platforms via an API. In our redesign, we also sought to enhance functionalities that were at the center of our offering and provide new functionalities based on user requests. You can see the full list of updated and new features on this slide, many of which were introduced during the trailer. I'll go into more detail into each of these in the coming slides. So first, 
You can use UN Biodiversity Lab to access over 400 of the world's best global spatial data layers. From the previous version of the platform, we've expanded our data list to offer new data on biodiversity, climate change, and sustainable development. We'll be continually expanding and updating this data list over the years to come. Second, we're excited to introduce our UN Biodiversity Lab data collections. Developed around key thematic areas, these collections help you to identify data sets that can generate insight and inform action in response to key questions for conservation and development planning. We currently offer collections on protected areas and nature-based solutions for climate change. And we're looking forward to developing further collections, especially around the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Third, UN Biodiversity Lab now offers the ability to calculate dynamic metrics and indicators for any country in the world at the click of a button. Here, you're seeing a screen capture of this functionality for Colombia currently showing their protected area network. We offer eight metrics, which you can see on this slide. We hope to expand this list of metrics in the future, especially to support calculation of global and national indicators for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Fourth, we now offer the ability to create secure workspaces to any non-commercial actor. These workspaces provide a password protected space for collaboration where you can upload national or subnational data layers into a secure repository and visualize them alongside our global data layers. You can also upload national or subnational areas of interest, such as a protected area network or a province, and calculate any of our dynamic metrics for this place. Fifth, as always, you can easily create and style your own maps for use in policy documents, plans, or communication products. And finally, we're excited to announce that in 2022, we'll add a proof of concept functionality that will enable countries to identify their essential life support areas where action to protect, manage, and restore nature can contribute to key global priorities. Initially available for three countries, we hope to scale this to all countries in the future. Okay. So I've thrown a whole lot of information at you about the new UMBL. And I'd like to take a moment here to pause and ask for all of your feedback. As with before, we're going to use a Menti poll here. And I'm going to ask you what feature of UMBL is most relevant to your work. So if you take a moment, you can scan the QR code on the screen with your phone you can also follow the link that's shown on the slide, and my colleagues are dropping that into the chat as well. All right, it looks like the text is very small here, but we're seeing some responses come in saying, looks like view dynamic metrics for my country and access global data layers and create maps are in the lead, followed by mapping countries' essential life support areas, creating a secure workspace, and accessing our customized data collections. We have a couple people who have other ideas. Um, if you add those into the chat, we'd be really excited to see what you're thinking. All right, I think we can let this play for maybe 15 more seconds, get a few more responses in, and then go back to the rest of our presentations. 
All right, great. It looks like our final uh, leading category is accessing global data layers, uh, followed closely by the dynamic metrics and creating maps. So we're really excited to explore all of these features with you in our upcoming presentations and sessions. Great, so to wrap up, I want to highlight three easy ways for you to get involved in UN Biodiversity Lab today. First, sign up for our mailing list. Just drop your email into the chat and we'll get you added right away. Second, sign up for an account to access preferred features. You can do this by navigating to unbiodiversitylab.org and clicking on the data tab. And third, contact us today to create your own UNBL workspace. You can do this by emailing my colleague D at the email listed on the screen. Before I wrap up, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our amazing UNBL partners. Donors and our many data providers, which you're seeing on this screen here. Great, so with that, I will wrap up this introduction to UN Biodiversity Lab and we'll move into our final part of today's session, which explores how users are applying UN Biodiversity Lab to support their work at the national level. We'll begin with a short video that explores multiple country use cases. We are facing a planetary emergency ensuring a healthy planet and reimagining development is essential for our very survival. To respond to biodiversity loss, climate change and rising inequality, we must invest in nature, which underpins the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. Together, we must create a global safety net by protecting managing and restoring our Earth. But where and how? Spatial data or maps can provide us with the answer. Today, we generate more data in the blink of an eye than in most of human history combined. But how do we use this data to address our planet's crisis? UN Biodiversity Lab is a special data platform that gives decision makers the ability to measure the pulse of the Earth, enabling more informed policy decisions. Building off the data available through this platform, UNDP is providing communities and governments with special insights to map areas essential for supporting life. Using cutting-edge science, we work with countries to prioritize and map their goals for biodiversity, for climate, and for sustainable development. The result, a map of hope that shows where to protect, sustainably manage, and restore nature to achieve goals for people and for the planet. By prioritizing where to take action on the ground, governments are reimagining development and putting nature at the center of decision making. Colombia is using its map of hope to create a nature centered water security plan for its central region, directly benefiting more than 15 million people. Costa Rica is using its map of hope to cool its urban areas with trees and to decarbonize the economy by increasing carbon sequestration from nature. Kazakhstan is using its map to scale up protected areas 
preserve biodiversity, and ensure the sustainable use of natural resources. Uganda is using its map of hope to inform its five-year national development plan and to prevent future disasters from flooding. And Peru is putting nature at the center of its green recovery from COVID-19 with a focus on indigenous peoples. We have 10 years to invest in nature. What we do now will determine the trajectory for the next decade and the next century. Now is the time to act. Join us as we support governments and communities in using special data to reimagine development and to put nature at the heart of sustainable development. All right, so this trailer provided you with a glimpse of the potential for use of spatial data in a variety of different countries. To hear more directly from our UNBL users, I'd first like to give the floor to Susana Rodriguez Buritica of Instituto Humboldt in Colombia. Susana, you have the floor. Okay, thanks. Um, as she said, I am a main researcher at the Humboldt Institute in Colombia. And let me start by saying that uh, Humboldt is a um, research institution affiliated with the Environmental Ministry in Colombia. Um, and the main uh, mission is to translate technical and scientific information for the society and decision makers at large. Um, I'm going to uh, discuss and present how we used the UN Biodiversity Lab with three examples of projects that we have developed at Humboldt. The first one is the development of BioTablero, which is within, within the same spirit as the UN Biodiversity Lab, a platform where decision makers could evaluate uh, indicators and biodiversity variables for specific areas. Um, in the making of BioTablero a couple of years ago, we decided to evaluate the global information available regarding uh, variables and indicators for biodiversity and evaluate how much of that could be applied to Colombia. Um, so this screen is an example of one of those indicators, the red list index for several groups and for several times estimated for the national for Colombia. Um, and in doing that evaluation, we used UN Biodiversity Lab to, um, to retrieve 16 layers and evaluate them according to the compliance to the CVD suggestions and the complementarity in terms of um, what they add to the national information. Um, from that evaluation, we selected a couple of indicators that now are included in the bio tablet. The second example is the uh, ELSA map and the um, conservation uh, systematic uh, land planning projects that we are conducted at Humboldt. Um, for these projects, we, have, we use a UN Biodiversity Lab to evaluate uh, global information that could be matched in the case of ELSA to political uh, goals at the national level and in the case of the other projects to complement national information already available. So these maps are um, the example of the output uh, from ELSA. And um, these are the two main layers that we used in all those projects. The first is structural condition index and the above ground biomass carbon. Um, the, the third and final example is the application of um, global methodology developed in Australia by Graham and collaborators that um, aims to describe forest integrity at the landscape level. And we use UN Biodiversity Lab to again evaluate which global information could complement our national repository uh, in order to describe either pressures regarding uh, the use of forest 
or um, uh, of the or the loss to con connectivity or the infer pressures, which are the main layers involved in the calculation of this index. <clears throat> and as you can see, um, in these uh, final products, the national uh, index gives a little bit better resolution than the global index. And this is in part because we use a, a good set of national layers, um, but also we complement it with high resolution layers that were available through the UN Biodiversity Lab, which were the Structural Condition Index and the Global Forest Layers developed by Hansen. <clears throat> and um, with this, um, I basically um, think that the UN Biodiversity Lab is a good tool for Humboldt because it allows in a very uh, fast and um, uh, convenient way the evaluation of global layers that complement national information. And in the particular case of ELSA, it has facilitated the communication regarding the final products of the project. We have a space at the UN Biodiversity Lab where we can publish the final maps from ELSA and all the basic the, the layers used for the development of the of the product, which um, enhance transparency and facilitate communication. So and with that I'll finish and I and I pass it now to my colleague from the Western and Balkans for her presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mihaela Dragan Lebovic, and um, I work as a nature based solution project officer for IUCN. And today I will give you a short presentation about the ADAPT project and how we use the UN Biodiversity Lab data um, for project activities. Uh, so basically, the first part of my presentation will um, be an introduction about who IUCN is, uh, what the YATA project is about, and also, um, well, the second part of the presentation will be focused basically on the data that we used uh, from UN Biodiversity Lab, <clears throat> as well as, uh, well, how we used that data and what was the, the, the impact. Okay, so for those of you that are not very familiar with IUCN, we are basically a, a membership-based organization. Um, amongst our members, we count uh, states and governments, um, government agencies, uh, ministries of environment, but also um, non-governmental organizations or um, an indigenous people organization. And we work main, mainly through a secretariat, uh, as well as uh, a couple of uh, IUCN commissions, thematic commissions focused on uh, either nature-based solutions or um, socioeconomic aspects and world heritage sites and so on. And basically the aim of our organization is to, uh, one, influence policy, uh, to um, uh, work towards the achievement of uh, the sustainable um, um, development goals, as well as bring direct benefits to people and, and nature. Um, and so, but because the ADAPT project is very much about applying nature-based solutions on the ground, uh, we wanted to start by explaining to you how IUCN actually defines nature-based solutions. And uh, we often define them as being um, no regret actions um, that provide benefits both to people and effects of natural disasters. So, uh, in order to coherently apply uh, this nature-based solution concept, IUCN published a global standard for NBS uh, in 2020. The standard um, is basically a, a, facilit a facilitative tool um, for design, verification and monitoring, as well as scaling up nature-based solutions on the ground. Um, the standard was really developed um, uh, based on uh, a highly consultative process and the UCN is in currently developing a full certification process for the standard. Um, our project, so ADAPT is financed by SIDA, um, the Swedish International Development Agency, uh, with a current contract value of around uh, 2.5 million euros. Um, the project has a lifetime of almost four years, three years and, um, and uh, eight months, and uh, we cover as a geographical scope, we cover the whole Western Balkan region. 
And so on this slide, what you can see actually is a representation of the three um, major pillars of activities in the ADAPT project. Um, and this refer to knowledge and capacity building, to policy, um, so basically mainstreaming the NBS concept into policy and processes. Uh, and the third pillar re refers to uh, implementation of MBS project on the ground and scaling up these projects on, on the ground. And it's basically in this third pillar of activities um, that we use the UN Biodiversity Lab data uh, in our project. Um, and so this slide basically shows you uh, what we mean by nature-based solutions field interventions. So this pilot projects um, that we are referring to uh, have different phases uh, of development. Uh, one of them is uh, conducting a series of what we call baseline assessments, uh, meaning a series of uh, environmental, socioeconomic and gender studies to establish a common um, um, baseline and, and um, a database uh, of information. Uh, then we move into the second phase of development of the pilot, which refers to technical design, so defining uh, really technical parameters with regards to the MBS measures that will be implemented on the ground, designing a monitoring and evaluation framework, and then we move on um, with uh, permitting and procurement um, of the goods and services for the last phase, which is basically um, implementing concretely the pilot on the ground or executing the pilot, so doing field works on, on the ground. And so for this first phase of baseline assessments, uh, um, we use UN Biodiversity Lab data. And I will explain in my, my future sl slides what exactly data we used and, and how. Um, so a result, uh, a final result, I would say, of the, um, um, this phase of baseline assessment was the production of a report called um, Restoration Opportunities Assessment Report. Um, this report um, presumed um, a, a, how to say, an extensive data collection and analysis process. Um, and for this, basically, we worked with a team of five experts uh, that applied the multi-criteria spatial analysis for our forest landscape restoration uh, project on the ground. So this meant basically that um, they combined um, data uh, gathering together with technical expertise and then also local knowledge collected through stakeholder engagement in, through consultation processes. And um, all this data collected basically served for the production of a series of maps that served um, 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 this uh, final report that I mentioned called Restoration Opportunities Assessment. So we developed a series of uh, maps such as functional degradation map, opportunity map, and then priority map for implementing MBS measures on the ground. Um, and so this is the UN Biodiversity uh, Lab data that we used, uh, that was used by the ADAPT project. And this refers mainly to uh, above ground carbon and below ground car carbon. Um, this data was used mainly by our socioeconomic expert for the realization of a cost-benefit analysis. Um, and then another um, um, set of data that I'd like to mention is the Forest Landscape Integrity Index. Uh, that was very important for the production of the functional, functional degradation map that we, we produced. Um, and so on my next slide here, what you can see is what we call the road to developing MBS scenarios by combining local, national, and global data. Um, and so to the very left of the slide, you can see basically some elementary data layers, uh, such as um, landslide data or erosion data, or a slopes uh, data, so slopes with um, different um, uh, degrees of, of steepness there, um, as well as the forest landscape integration, um, the, the forest landscape integrity index uh, that we use from UN Biodiversity Lab. So all these data layers was were basically overlapped by our GIS expert, um, and they gave birth to this. Uh, a functional degradation map um, that again then overlapped with a forest degradation map gave us this uh, forest landscape um, restoration opportunities and then priorities. So from a very wide area, a spatial area that was um, a thousand of um, um, square kilometers at municipality level, we ended up with a, a really narrowed down um, uh, intervention area. And what you can see actually on the 
bright side of the slide uh, are a couple of examples of the types of uh, NBS measures that were suggested by, by our teams of experts to be implemented on the ground. They refer to um, natural assisted um, um, rehabilitation of forest, uh, also to restoration by planting or to cultivation of medicinal and um, aromatic plants, to the implementation of bioengineering measures on areas that had a very high slope or uh, to the establishment of silvopastoral um, measures um, in, the, in the area. Okay, so to conclude now on, on the importance of uh, making this uh, data from UN Bi Biodiversity Lab available to us, um, well, um, you can see on this slide basically the data we used and the impact that uh, it had on our project. Like I mentioned before, it was uh, really of primordial importance that our socioeconomic uh, expert has this um, biomass uh, carbon data in order to calculate the carbon sequestration potential that our MBS scenarios um, uh, will contribute to, you know, to avoid it, uh, carbon basically uh, through the implementation of, of these MBS measures on the ground. So that was very important to us. And the same goes for the forest landscape uh, intact, uh, intactness uh, index. It was really important um, to have this data layer in order to produce the functional degradation map because that was really the, how to say, the original map that then led to calculating uh, restoration opportunities potential and priority areas for future intervention. So we just yeah, wanted uh, in, in closing to thank um, UN Biodiversity Lab for making this data available to third party organizations like, like ours. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for your attention and I'm available if you have any further questions. Hi, thank you for having us here today. My name is Enrique Paniagua, and I work as policy expert for UNDP and as a climate adaptation specialist for the Ministry of Environment of Costa Rica and UNEP. And here with me is Cornelia Miller. She is the director of PRIAS Lab in Costa Rica, and we are going to introduce to you the project Mapping Nature for Climate Adaptation. So it is important to understand uh, what is ELT project. It is a uh, UNDP project that has been running since 2019. And the Ministry of Environment and PRIAS are the national partners in Costa Rica. So um, ELTA stands for Essential Life Support Areas. And these are areas that, if conserved, restore, or sustainably manage can offer benefits related to food security, water security, climate change, and uh, other topics. So uh, the aim of the project is to map ELSAs to promote science-based policies and decision making. And um, in the in the back of uh, of the project, we want to take nature out of the conservation silo um, because nature really can deliver uh, many benefits for different sectors and we want to showcase this. So why ELSA for climate adaptation? First, Central America, where Costa Rica is located, is one of the most vulnerable regions to impacts of uh, climate change. By 2025, the reconstruction um, due to climate impacts could represent 2.5 of Costa Rica's GDP, and this is likely to increase in future um, years. And as we know, nature resolutions can offer um, a solution um, to increase this uh, climate resilience. And as a matter of fact, the National Policy on Climate Change Adaptation states uh, that um, the nature-based solutions should be uh, addressed and, uh, and, and it is basically one key line of action within the policy. And in these um, past years, uh, actually in, in 2021, the ministry decided to create 
a national climate adaptation plan to really um, define the specific actions that should be taken into consideration or, or implemented to um, execute the policy. So we have created ELSA adaptation to inform the national climate adaptation plan. Um, so to have a, a, a little idea on what are the main steps of ELSA, we can summarize them in, in these four, four steps. To identify national priorities in uh, the, country, the country's policies. This is the first step. Then we want to uh, collect the related data sources that are, that are um, important to uh, or that speak to those policy priorities. Then using a web tool, we combine the data layers with the policy priorities to then produce an ELSA map. This is how it goes in simple words. And now I'm going to leave you with my colleague, Cornelia Miller, to go a little deeper on uh, ELSA process. Cornelia, please. Thank you, Enrique. Well, here you have an a image of the policy priorities and data layers. So this is how the, we bridge science with uh, policy. So we have the doc policy document, the commitments, that our uh, main authorities are uh, taken, and then the planning features. And with this information, science on the scientific side, we take it to work um, the solution that uh, will address these, um, these priorities. We have a um, situation uh, for our country, and the, what you can see here, the medium temperature and precipitation scenarios for Costa Rica. And I'm pointing out in that circle, Guanacaste, which is an area very important for our country because of tourist attraction, protected areas that are World Heritage Site. Um, we have a presence of a blue zone, one of the few ones in the world. Uh, it's uh, the, the folklore of Costa Rica comes from mostly from this area. And of course, we have a uh, thing with food security. So the question will be, by using Earth observations, what nature-based actions can be taken to adapt to climate change? So for this, we, did, we need data. We have all these um, two areas from the policy and from the science. And the data is very important to work um, in Earth observations. We have international layers that we um, acquire from the uni UN Biodiversity Lab, we have national layers, and then we have uh, layers that come from the National Capital Projects for the University of Stanford. And with all these, we um, get together, it's a teamwork with um, the government and the scientists to uh, find solutions. So we decided in these meetings with two groups. Um, the map you will be seeing soon has an area with zones that have blocking options of what has already been done in the country and actions to execute. And the features are the, the, the areas of uh, improvement that we are foreseeing for, to, to come with the policy. So here you have the map, the ELSA climate change adaptation, and we have the areas to protect, restore, manage, the urban greening, and um, the existing protected areas are shown there and are the ones that are blocked because it's what the country has already been done. So here I uh, give the pass to Enrique to continue with this presentation. Thank you very much, Cornelia, for uh, explaining us a little more about the ELSA process and how we um, develop the, the map. Uh, so I want to just give you a brief idea on how what, what is the impact of the project, how we go from science uh, that the Cornelia just explained to us to the policy. So um, we work together with the authorities um, in the creation of, of the national adaptation plan, and the ELSA results are embedded in six targets. Of, the, of this plan, and three of them involve ecosystem restoration actions. 
uh, in different locations of the country. Um, furthermore, we um, we have a lot of um, we have perceived a lot of interest from the authorities to use ELSA uh, adaptation results in other policy processes. So um, the um, national system of protected areas has expressed their interest to apply it the results uh, to the implementation of the national strategy for landscape uh, restoration which is implemented by the ministry of agriculture and the ministry of environment so it's amazing to have elsa results um, applied here in, the, in in this joint action between these ministries that uh, not very often work together and uh, they also want to uh, consider the results for the red strategy for the national wetlands program the payment for for environmental services uh, program um, and the forever costa rica program so there is a lot of appetite uh, here to apply the um, results and um, yeah we're very happy with this well, thank you very much. I hope you uh, have enjoyed the presentation and that you are interested on the, uh, the project and that it serves um, uh, to you as, as uh, an idea to develop more ideas. Thank you. So thank you so much for all of our guest speakers today. Um, what a great presentation. Um, I really am excited for the rest of our, our series. Um, we're so glad to be here with the support of the full UN Biodiversity Lab Partnership, which includes colleagues from UNEP, UNEPWC, MC, UNDP, and CBD. Um, we're so excited um, to have you all and, and really appreciate these presentations. Um, and I just wanted to have a few reminders for you all here um, is the contact information um, for myself, my colleague Juan, and um, Annie and Dee uh, from UNDP, who you can email with any questions that we may not get to in today's session or in, in later sessions as well. I also wanted to remind you all of our training website shown here. Please visit the website for the recordings, the presentation materials, and any other information about the, um, the training as well. Um, we, you can also follow us on Twitter and get, get updates of um, trainings that are coming up in a variety of different application areas, such as health and air quality, water resources, climate, disasters. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, our sister programs within NASA's Capacity Building Program, DEVELOP, which is our, our internship program, and SEVERE, which is our um, international um, project-based uh, arm. And um, so you can check out these, these other programs for more information of, of internship opportunities, for case study examples, for work being done potentially in your area of interest as well. So um, please uh, join us for our, our next um, session. And um, we, we thank you again for, for being with us today. And we will now um, move on to the question and answer session. Thank you. Great, so to kick off our question and answer session, we're just throwing up our first mentee that we did way back at the beginning of this session to explore where all of our participants are from. So this is a, a frozen version of the link. You won't see it changing like the last one, but it looks like South Africa, India, US, Germany, UK are emerging as some of the top countries with a whole lot of other ones in here. We've got Singapore, Pakistan, Australia, some that are so small, I'm even having trouble reading them. Um, looks like we've got a few people from Ukraine. Amazing to have you here and hope that you're safe. 
Um, all right, so we just wanted to share that with all of you. Oh, it looks like a couple more getting added in. Um, so we just wanted to share that to give a sense of who's joining us here today for the English session. Um, so with that, I think we can turn over and go to the questions and answers that we've been collecting throughout the session. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Annie. Um, really cool to see uh, where everyone's coming from. I think that's the first time we've done that for an RSET training. So um, yeah, maybe we'll have to do that again. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone, um, uh, for your attention today. We're so glad to be with, he with you here. Um, and we're so uh, thankful for the support of the full UN Biodiversity Lab Partnership, which includes our colleagues from UNEP, UNEP, um, WCMC, UNDP, and CBD. So um, thanks again for everyone joining today and for being with us. Um, so now we will have some time for, for questions. I, I recognize that this session um, went almost uh, to the end here before we got to the question and answers, but we will um, stay online and um, go over a few minutes if you're able to stay with us. Um, I did want to mention that we'll be walking through many of these questions here today, um, but we won't be able to get to all of your questions. So we will be including uh, many of your questions in this document and we'll be uploading the um, Q&A document to the course website within about a week or so after we go through and make sure we have all the information here correct. So do please check back on the website at a later date if we didn't quite get to your question or you just want to have some of these links that our team has provided for reference um, later on. So that will be available for you all. Um, and I've also listed again um, the email addresses for myself, um, Juan and Annie here. Um, if you have further questions beyond what we're able to get to today in the rest of the training series, um, you can certainly email um, us as well. So let's jump right into it and get to some of these questions. Um, I will be going through the questions and um, for the majority of these, um, they'll be answered by our UN Biodiversity Lab team here. So um, really thankful that they're, they're on and joining us. Um, so the first question is, which app is good for wild, wildlife species population counting? Um, it's a great question. There are many, satellite data as well as ground-based um, data for species uh, occurrence collection. Um, and we actually have an entire training series on this. So I've linked that at the end. Um, we have a whole training series on species distribution modeling. And um, what I wanted to highlight here is that um, when we think about the use of remote sensing for species, the remote sensing data, in particular the data from NASA, are really used to identify environmental variables that are suitable for specific species. We're not really able to identify uh, specific species with the um, satellite data, um, but the environmental data, things like looking at vegetation health, um, using the normalized difference vegetation index, also looking at phenology and change in large scale um, plant dynamics, um, things like looking at change over time, forest degradation, um, wildfires, um, those can all influence where we find species um, and how they move. And um, also we mentioned land cover maps um, in the beginning of this session, and that's a really great way to identify areas of suitable habitat for whatever species you're interested in. And I will say there are many um, uh, online tools, citizen science projects, um, things like eBird and iNaturalist, where um, folks from around the world are collecting species occurrence data and sharing that. Um, so again, do please check out our RSET training on species distribution modeling. We have uh, many sessions uh, devoted to this very single question here. So it's a it's a really great question. Um, great, so I think we'll move on to question two. How can a country add their own data 
to the UN Biodiversity Lab platform. So I'll, I'll let um, some of my team members here speak to this question. Thanks, Amber. I can jump in on this one. So as you heard briefly during my presentation today, we do offer UN Biodiversity Lab secure workspaces to users. Uh, so this offers you a private space where you can upload your own data and visualize it in combination with any of the global data layers available through the site. You're also able to upload any shape files of interest to calculate our metrics for the area in which your project works, the protected areas network in your country, any other area of interest. Uh, so I'll drop into our chat our page, which has more information on our workspaces. And this is also something we'll explore in a lot more depth in the third session of our intermediate training two weeks from today, and also in our second advanced lab, which will be on May 4th. Great, thanks, Annie. So moving on to question three, could you provide further details on the integration and the API functionalities? Is it possible to access UNBL data with programmatic languages such as Python or R? And does UNBL provide cloud computing functionalities? Thanks, Amber. Oh, Sorry, Oscar, I was just going to hand it over to you. <laughs> Please jump in. No problem at all. Well, yeah, no, as, um, well, what was I going to say? Well, at the, at the moment, um, as, as, as you see here, our kind of API integration really focuses more on kind of building a um, environment, um, a digital infrastructure um, for uh, sharing biodiversity data. So we're very much looking at how we hook up to other people's APIs to ensure that data is up to date and is updated as it is updated by the uh, data provider, for example. Um, we hook into various different systems like Google Earth Engine, Carto, or and also looking at Esri at the moment. Um, and then the other point to whether we provide um, a kind of access for programmatic languages. At the moment, UN Biodiversity Lab sees itself much more as um, a data provider so we're not really a data producer and we're trying to build links back to data providers so we are in at the moment we are kind of pushed not pushing data directly from the website we're pushing back to the um the source of the data so we're not offering that integration with python and r but these are all sort of um elements that we are exploring and um, improving um, the offering and looking forward and then finally, UN Biodiversity Lab is run on cloud and offers cloud storage and also um, uh, a lot of the uh, analytics that you see for an area of interest are all done via cloud computing. Um, so hopefully that goes some way to answering that question. Thanks so much, Oscar. Yeah, um, a lot of nice functionality there. Um, and I, I also wanted to mention we do have um, some RSET trainings on Google Earth Engine. So I know that that's a um, really popular tool right now. So um, check back for, for more on that. OK, question four. How do you validate the data layers for accuracy? I'm very uh, happy to jump in there. <laughs> if you can. Um, so just, I guess, a couple of things on this. Um, the team, the UNBL team has adopted a set of criteria to help us uh, review any data that are suggested for the site. And so these criteria help us to review the relevance to policy and decision making, the accessibility of the data, the transparency, and the geographic coverage, among other aspects. And this is very much uh, for us to develop relationships with our data providers to help to encourage greater alignment with these criteria, and also to, how to, to ensure that these data are fit for purpose for decision making, particularly in context of um, uh, parties' requirements um, in the context of countries. So. We very much welcome feedback on these criteria. There's a, a link in here, and we can provide that later on to these propo proposed criteria that are applied to the data sets. And also a quick note that we are always um, welcoming of feedback on the data sets. As I mentioned, we very much focus on building relationships with the data providers. So they also very much appreciate any feedback on the data. 
Um, and also, if there's any data that you would like to, re to recommend, there's also an opportunity to be able to submit new data uh, for consideration. So we would we would welcome that. We do focus uh, for the time being on global data sets. But yes, please do get in touch with the team if you have any any questions along these lines. Great, thanks so much, Lauren. And really interesting to to note that you all are open to additional data sets, primarily global data sets as they apply here. So very cool. Next question, um, how often is spatial data updated? I think this is back to me. And I think the unhelpful answer is that this is very much dependent on the data set you're interested in, in terms of how frequently it's updated. But in terms of the update frequency within UN Biodiversity Lab, it's very much um, that we link directly to the source of data and we uh, use the API for a data set where possible. So in terms of how update, uh, up to date the data is on UN Biodiversity Lab, it's as up to date as the data provider makes it. So um, it's kind of a, a two-stage question. I can't answer to the specifics of any specific data set, but um, UN Biodiversity Lab is always up to date when that layer is uh, updated. Perhaps just a quick addition on that note is this is one of the criterion that we include in the, the, pre, the answer to the previous question, actually. So we do try to ensure that the data sets are the, are the best available um, for, for the, a given feature. Um, so just to add that on that note. Great. Thank you, Oscar and Lauren, um, for that note. Okay, question six. What is the map scale of spatial data provided? So I think people are going to be bored of hearing from me, but essentially, again, this is very much specific on the data set of interest. Um, but if I think about the data that is currently hosted in UN Biodiversity Lab, I can think of some raster data sets uh, that are as fine scale as 10 meter. Um, for example, the new Esri uh, lab cover data set. Um, and in general, there may be other data sets derived from NASA Landsat data that are kind of more sort of 30 meter accuracy. Um, it's an interesting question as well, though, because, I mean, if I think about vector data sets like the World Database and Protected Areas, which is composed of sort of national levels and fed up into a more global system, that's um, very hard to put a scale value on because you're dealing with boundaries that are, provide, are coming from various different sources um, and, and at various different locations. So it's very hard to find that kind of scale for that sort of data set. So really, in response to that, I think it's about understanding the data set that you're using and whether it's adequate for your purposes. Great, thank you so much, Oscar, for that. Okay, question seven. Can I identify vegetation species from, from my specific area of interest? Um, I think this goes back a little bit to our first question. And can I calculate the carbon stored in above and below ground vegetation of my area of interest? Me again. So um, I think um, to really focus on, especially on the second half of it, that UN Biodiversity Lab does host an above and below ground carbon layer. Um, and basically that can be used to kind of look at an area of interest um, and base, uh, we can see the kind of metrics against that area of interest against the um, above and below the ground carbon layer. So you can kind of get a good understanding of what the kind of um, carbon storage is for any sort of area of interest on the, on the website at the moment. Um, it might be that you kind of play around with other layers on the, on the uh, on your biodiversity labs, such as integrating it with a, a land cover layer to really sort of understand what the vegetation is that might be driving that carbon metric that you're seeing. Great, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, and then uh, I guess refer to question one about the species aspect of that as well. Question eight, how do I download data to prepare maps for analysis in a GIS platform? I think I can jump back in here. Uh, this is another one that we'll be exploring a lot more in our upcoming session. So we offer two options for you through UN Biodiversity Lab. The first is as a registered user, you are 
should be able to clip the data to your area of interest and download for use in desktop GIS. I will caveat that by saying we're doing some updates to that tool right now. So it's not currently online, but it should be available again shortly. And for those of you who are interested in the full uh, global underlying data sets, we provide links so you can download those from the original data provider where that is permitted by them. So we'll be walking through that a lot more in next week's session, as well as in our first advanced lab. And you can see here we've also shared our support page and public platform user guide, which has this information as well. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Annie. Question nine. Let's, oh, can we scroll back down a bit? Great. Thank you. Let's say that while working as an independent consultant, I would like to access biodiversity risk for companies' operations and our investment portfolios. Am I allowed to use UNBL data and private workspace for that purpose? I'm happy to jump in here, actually. Maybe and colleagues might like to, to compliment. But um, at the moment, UN Biodiversity Lab has a um, commercial use restriction. So I'm afraid that it wouldn't be possible for commercial entities to do this. That said, we do recommend looking at the individual data sets that are hosted on UN Biodiversity Lab, as um, some do, in fact, permit commercial use. And you can then go and download those data sets for your particular area of interest. Um, and just to note that UNIP, WCMC, and our partners also offer to opportunities for commercial use of biodiversity data through other tools. So the integrated biodiversity assessment tool, for instance, uh, provides access to the World Database and Protected Areas, World Database and Key Biodiversity Areas, and also the IUCN Red List. Um, so those are, that's a useful resource, as well as Encore, which is useful for um, being able to help financial institutions understand how they can move towards uh, aligning their portfolios with global biodiversity goals. So there's a, a range of sort of derived information there that might be useful in this context. And finally, Global Forest Watch Pro is also tailored to commercial use. So there are existing tools. Um, and yes, I think this is something that we will uh, explore further in the future, but for the time being, um, there is that commercial, commercial use restriction. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Question 10, will it be possible to drill down into provincial or country data per country? The short answer to this is yes, it is. Um, so we, if you go onto your biodiversity lab and you click on the places tool, you'll see that we offer sub-national regions for countries as well as national uh, boundaries for countries. Um, but in the, in the instance where your region is not available, um, it is possible to upload your own boundaries or area of interest into your own private UN Biodiversity Lab uh, workspace. Um, and actually, it's something we'll be exploring in session three um, of our intermediate training and advanced lab two. And maybe if I can just jump in to compliment Oscar there as well. I realize as we were giving this answer response in the document, um, we only half answered it. So what Oscar is speaking about is our areas of interest and places available on the platform. So, so that enables you to calculate our metrics uh, using global data layers for any country or subnational area of interest. Currently on UN Biodiversity Lab, what we make available on the public platform is focused on globally available data layers, uh, since all of the data that we post is assessed against our data criteria standard by the global team at this point, uh, adding regional or country level data on the public platform is not possible. However, uh, through the workspaces, we do enable users to upload data for their own country and add um, collaborators to create a community of practice within your country. Uh, so happy to talk more about that. As Oscar mentioned, we'll be talking more about those functionalities in upcoming sessions. Uh, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thanks, Danny. So uh, moving on to question 10. As an environmental preservation NGO in France, can we upload very high spatial resolution maps onwards of 0.5 meters, perform our analysis, and publish publicly the results as a link to our website? 
So I can jump in again here and I might ask Oscar to add his thoughts as well. So right now, the only option we have that might be possible for this is through our UNBL workspaces where you could upload the data layers that you have. That being said, I don't think that either on the public platform or in our workspaces, we've dealt with that high of resolution previously. So I think we'd want to talk with you and with our technical team to understand a little bit more about the total file sizes you would be adding and whether we would have an upper limit that we would need to enforce. Uh, in terms of publishing publicly on UNBL, at this point, that's not possible. We only uh, share the global data layers on the public platform, but you're more than welcome to add users to your workspace um, and collaborate with others in that way. Oscar, I don't know if you have any more thoughts about that high resolution data and any other considerations we might want to think about? To be honest, Annie, I think you've been quite comprehensive. The reality is that we haven't dealt with um, a private workspace where uh, an organization has been uploading data at that fine scale. So it is going to be a case of us kind of um, using it as a test case. Um, so it would be really great to have that engagement with you um, to explore that further. Great, thanks, Annie and Oscar. Um, let's move on. Um, I think we'll maybe skip question 12 as I think we've previously answered it. Um, so we'll move on here to, maybe we'll, we'll um, take a look at question 13 and come back to it if possible. Or would you all like to answer that live? We, we could certainly move on to question 14 if that's more appropriate. Oscar, what do you think? I blatantly tagged you in the document. Do you have anything you could add in at this point, or is that something you'd want to think about a little bit further? I'm really sorry, Annie. I missed that. No, it's fine. It, if better, we can skip it and move on to uh, question 14, uh, if you don't have any thoughts off the top of your head. Either way, it's totally fine. I'm also very happy to answer question 14 because <laughs> this is always one that's quite close to my heart. Great, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, let's let's go on to 14. So the question here is all case studies and data layers seem focused on terrestrial examples. Can you expand on limitations and opportunities of UNBL for marine environments? Uh, firstly, thank you very much to whoever raised this. As I mentioned, um, as someone with a marine background, I always appreciate when the when we <laughs> when the marine environment isn't forgotten. Um, but yes, I think this is an area that we absolutely would like to continue to to build on, um, particularly as the number of uh, marine related, especially global biodiversity data sets are increasing over time. There is a marine filter on UN Biodiversity Lab, and at the moment that directs you to 26 marine related data sets. And these include things like global fishing watch, global surface water layers, um, and various other layers on marine and coastal habitats. So there's quite a, a variety there. Um, these very much can be used for any analyses that might be of interest. And as I think mentioned earlier, we do welcome suggestions for new global layers. So please do um, get in touch if you if you see one that would be uh, well suited to the to UN Biodiversity Lab, because we'd love to approach the data providers and discuss it, the opportunity. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, so question 15 um, asks about water resources and atmospheric parameters on UNBL. Should we um, skip over that one or would any of you like to try to take that one on live as well? I think probably um, skipping over it for the moment, but um, we will make sure to put a list of resources against that question in response to it. Um, as Lauren indicated, we do have filters to kind of identify resources by whether they be marine or um, uh, or freshwater, for example. Um, and then the atmospheric parameters, I would just need to go and have a quick look at um, if I was to answer this properly. So I'll have to take some time to answer it. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Oscar. Okay, um, question 16, I think I will go ahead and take. Um, so. Uh, the question is, which is an optimized app that could be used for ongoing measurement of regrowth of trees and vegetation? Um, and that is a really uh, interesting question. I think there are a couple methods for doing this. Um, 
I did not make note of it in the text here, but it just came to mind that um, if you're interested in using optical data for looking at um, regrowth of trees and vegetation, a really great tool that we've highlighted in some other trainings, um, which I can link to as well, is LandTrender. Um, so LandTrender allows you to look at changes over time using Landsat data of um, a variety of vegetation types, but it primarily focused on forests. And so you can um, identify things like uh, mountain pine beetle effects, um, identify um, logging or wildfires, and then um, look at regrowth. And the LandTrender tool uses um, things like the NDVI, which I mentioned, and BR, some other vegetation indices. And there is a um, way to use LandTrender in uh, Google Earth Engine. So I'll make note of a previous training where we highlighted that as well. And the other comment here is that if you're really interested in things like um, forest stand height or um, canopy height, you really do need to um, use things like SAR data which uh, SAR data is very different than, than a lot of the optical data that we're talking about here, um, but it allows you to you know, penetrate through um, clouds and look at um, the um, backscattering of the, the, um, the LIDAR in order to identify things like height. So you could see things like growth of trees over large um, regions using synthetic aperture radar SAR data. And I've linked a previous RSET training that we have where we um, identify SAR data for forest monitoring and provide some Google Earth Engine codes for, for doing some of that analysis as well. So those are the um, two sort of avenues I would suggest for exploration for looking at things like regrowth of trees and vegetation. OK, um, and I do know that we are um, quite a bit over time here, and I think we do need to get um, ready for our uh, French session, which is our, the next session that we have for today. Um, so maybe I will go ahead and end the, the Q&A session here for us all, and just make note that we'll be going through some of these questions we weren't able to get to today. Um, and come back to them and, and make some edits and provide more info and put that um, back on the training website um, within about a week or so, so you can check back on that. And I do want to thank everyone who has helped us out today and has been on to answer these questions. Um, please join us for our next intermediate session at the same time next week using the same link. Um, and we'll be um, really um, focusing on the public platform and um, talking about some of those data layers that we mentioned briefly um, in UNBL today and, and um, sort of getting into the meat of things a little bit more. So we're really excited to continue this series. Um, so thanks again, everyone, those of you from around the world um, for joining us. And we're, we're excited to be with you and we will hopefully see you all next week. So thank you all.